So, Paul, welcome back once again. Great to be here again. We're going to have a little bit of a more controversial topic today around fibre because I know for eons we've been, you know, told the importance of, you know, intake of soluble and insoluble fibre. But you've got some different viewpoints to share with us. Yeah, this was absolutely astonishing for me, Joe. Earlier this year, I was looking at the literature. I was writing, uh, writing a chapter for a textbook. And I was looking at the evidence on fibre intake and what I found was that the, the evidence is totally at odds with what our common beliefs are, uh, conventional wisdom or guidelines, what have you, that fibre is necessary for good gut health and that it's the best and most optimal treatment for constipation is not borne out when we actually look at the literature. So, and I think probably the easiest way to think about it, we can think about it logically in a couple of ways to start with. So I'm sure some of the viewers will have heard of malabsorption syndrome. Um, they come in several different formats, but essentially if you eat something that is not able to be digested by your body or absorbed in the intestines, then it ends up transiting right down to the distal colon where all the, the bugs that form the microbiome live. And those bacteria will then ferment a, uh, a particular food source and in the process they'll produce gas mm -hmm. and we associate that with bloating and several other symptoms. Now that's exactly the way that fibre works. So fibre is a non-digestible carbohydrate. So when we eat it, it doesn't get absorbed across our intestines, it transits all the way through and when it gets fermented by the bacteria we produce gas and we produce bloating. And there's been an awful amount of literature that has shown that increased levels of fibre intake are associated with significant disturbances of gal's function. You get constipation, you get bloating, people just generally don't feel very well. And on the other side of the coin, I said, well, what happens if you don't have any fibre? You know, what happens to your gut health then? Because we're always told how important it is for our gut health. Mm -hmm. And there's only been one experimental study that I could find that looked at the symptoms of constipation and compared high and low fibre diets. And it's not a randomised controlled trial because unfortunately there is zero randomised controlled trials on this topic. So we just had to settle for, uh, it was still an experimental design. And they took people who had what's called idiopathic constipation, which means, uh, which is like the constipation that my patients will walk in with. We're not 100% sure of the cause, but we certainly know they're constipated. And we pushed, put those patients on varying diets, and they range from high fibre diets down to zero fibre diets. So that's no fibre at all. Mm -hmm. And in every single one of the patients on the zero fibre diets, they had complete 100% resolution of all symptoms of their constipation. Bleeding, bloating, strain opening the bowels. So it, there were six symptoms and they all completely resolved. And the frequency of bowel actions on the people on the zero fibre diet, and there was 41 people in this group, was exactly one bowel action per day, every day. And the frequency of bowel action in the group on the highest fibre diet, one bowel action every 6.83 days. And that to date is the only experimental design that has ever looked at changing the amount of fibre in the diet on symptoms of constipation. Now there are other studies out there that will look at uh, what we call fecal bulking or transit time. Now, so we do know that adding fibre will make the faeces bigger, but is that necessarily a good thing? If we think about constipation as having trouble pushing something through a small hole, a sphincter as you will, then adding fibre to bulk out the faeces makes no more sense than adding cars to clear a traffic jam. It's just really illogical. And certainly that's been borne out by the evidence. And then I thought, so I was reading this and I thought, but we're told about the other benefits of fibre, that it leads to the production of the short chain fatty acids and butyric acids and these kind of things, and they nourish the cells that line our colon. And that is absolutely true. You do produce those and they get absorbed. These short chain fatty acids get absorbed by the cells that line the colon. But here's the thing. They then get converted to ketones. And the ketones then provide sufficient energy for these cells that line our colon to produce a, a healthier mucus layer and other things. So in effect, the state of nutritional ketosis, somebody on a ketogenic diet is going to be getting all the benefits of these ketones 
And not only that, they get it without the side effects of bloating. And rather than being uh, only applied to some of the cells lining our colon in a, in a small area where they're produced, these ketones, when you're in systemic ketosis, can be supplied to all the cells lining the intestine, right from the mouth, right through to the anal sphincter. So I was looking at this and um, I was as surprised as anybody, but as a scientist, I really have to conclude that, uh, uh, that fibre is not an essential part of the diet. And that you're starting to actually look at this with your clients and running these you know, considerations and, and what you're... We have lots of people with inflammatory bowel disease mm. who when they reduce the fibre in their diet, they get huge symptomatic improvement. Mm. And that, at the end of the day, for a patient, it's, you know, proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Well, in terms not of only their that, response. And not only that, it's, uh, it's also supported by the literature. It's mm. just unfortunately, the literature hasn't translated into guidelines. Mm. It's a fascinating topic, and thank you so much for providing this additional information. My pleasure. Thank you.